<clears throat> Thank you. Good evening. <clears throat> I want to welcome our, our latest chapter from the Reno Sparks area, these people that are sitting in the back here. Uh, maybe we'll get an opportunity to discuss some of the things that, that they're doing in that area after the talk. I'm going to talk about the subject that I know best, and that's the American Indian Movement, why it was formed, what we have done since its formation, and some of its projections and goals for coming years. Early part of 1968, uh, several <coughs> Indian people in the Twin City area of Minneapolis start forming a coalition. They call it the Concerned Indian American Coalition. Shortly after we incorporated and became a, a body, we found out that this didn't fit in at all with, with the American Indian Movement's goals. Uh, you know, the initials of the Concerned Indian American Coalition was CIA. So we changed that and became known as the American Indian Movement. But prior to the formation of the American Indian Movement, I guess each and every one of us living in that particular area belonged to one, two, three, sometimes five of the different Indian organizations that had formed there over the past 15, 20 years to try to create some type of social change. Every one of these Indian agencies, and there was 19 of them at the time of the formation of the American Indian Movement, every one of these Indian agencies were governed or controlled in one way or the other by the churches, by ex-BIA officials, or the people that were employed within the Bureau of Indian Affairs structure at the present time, uh, people from the League of Women Voters, the Minnesota Council of Churches, public welfare, and et cetera, Every time any type of action was taken relating to the Indian community, there was never a majority of Indian people within that organization to act on resolutions, pass resolutions, or bring forth various problems that were confronting the Indian people in that community. Knowing this, and knowing that the door was always either closed or either, you know, whenever we came forth with very uh, strong resolutions in regard to problems such as police problems, educational problems, housing, welfare, and et cetera, knowing that every time we talked about these things, our resolutions were tabled, or there was a secret meeting being held to table a resolution that we passed a week before, and knowing that Indian people were not getting anywhere in the Twin City area of Minneapolis, St. Paul, we decided that we needed a coalition such as the one that we put together. At the, at the time that we formed, formulated the American Indian Movement in the city of Minneapolis, we were concerned only at that time with the urban Indian situation. We were well aware many of our members from the American Indian Movement had served on the National Indian Task Force that was established early in 1968. And this is the President's National Indian Task Force that was doing the case study of the Bureau of Indian Affairs structure. In November of 1969, shortly after the formation of the movement, but at the point where we really got off the ground, there was a, a book released called Our Brother's Keeper, the Indian and White America. Two of our, our people from our staff and people from the state of Minnesota had served on that particular task force. It was the first time in history that a case study was ever done of the system of the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the churches by Indian people. And we found out that, you know, some of the conditions that we already knew about were exemplified in, in that particular report. We found out, for instance, that the gross annual income of the American Indian is three-fourths below what is considered a national poverty level, established at $1,500 a year. Places like the Navajo Reservation, Pine Ridge, and Rosebud, and uh, some of the, the, the smaller reservations in the state of Minnesota the gross annual income dropped anywhere from between $500 to $800 a year. We found out that the suicidal rate, because of PHS and, and other public health services not bringing these services to the Indian community like they should, the suicidal rate was seven times the national average. The high school dropout rate in America, particularly the Indian community, was established and set at 65% nationally. In Minneapolis, it was higher than that. We knew that housing was substandard. We found out in this particular report and study that was done by and in people for a change that it was considered 87% substandard. And of that, something like 72% didn't have running water. If it did, it was contaminated or polluted in some way. Knowing these things, you know, the American Indian Movement, when it formed, decided that it had to become 
a different type of agency. It had to become an organization that was concerned about Indian people, the conditions that Indian people were forced to live under. It became known as an organization that was very, very vocal organization that would stand up and fight for Indian people. That we would become an advocate for Indian people. That we would attack the Bureau of Indian Affairs every way possible to bring forth the services that they were supposed to be providing. We would attack the judicial system, which at the time of our formation in the city of Minneapolis, the Minneapolis workhouse alone, the percentage in there as far as Indians was concerned ran at about approximately 38%. The state prison in the state of Minnesota was 18% Indian. The state reformatory was approximately 13% Indian, population of approximately 800 inmates. The women's institution in the state of Minnesota, Sock Center, was 33% Indian. Today, every one of those statistics, particular statistics, have been lowered because of the programs that the American Indian Movement have established in that state to take care of the problems that have been created for Indian people. We knew that when we formed the American Indian Movement, we considered the three worst enemies of Indians to be the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the educational system nationally, and the churches. And we didn't set any one of them higher than the other as far as priorities were concerned. We knew that all three of them had to be taken care of. When we formed the American Indian Movement in the city of Minneapolis, we found out in a little case study that we'd done of our own with police and courts that from 35 to 40 arrests took place every weekend in the Indian community. We found out also that Indian people were not just charged with the particular offense that they were picked up for. We found out that if an Indian was picked up walking down Franklin Avenue in the city of Minneapolis by the paddy wagon, nine times out of 10 before he appeared in court the next day, he also was charged with breach of peace, using profanity in public, attempted assault, resisting arrest, and etc. So we established immediately a program to change this particular condition. We talked to the aldermen, we talked to the mayor, we talked to the police chief, and et cetera, judges, and we told them about this specific problem. And they asked us what we proposed. And we told them that we were going to establish an Indian citizen's patrol, an all Indian citizen's patrol. And whether they cooperated with us or not, we were going to be on the streets every night, 24 hours a day, looking out for Indian people. We were going to be in courts every morning defending those Indian people. And for 22 straight weekends, shortly after the formation of this patrol, which carried cameras, tape recorders, had radios in our cars, canvassed and monitored every arrest that was taking place in the community that we could get to. For 22 straight solid weekends, we didn't have a single arrest in the Indian community in the city of Minneapolis. It's almost unbelievable. Four months after the formation of the American Indian Movement, we start taking a very close look at the churches. We found out that the Minnesota Council of Churches, six years ago, established what they call a Department of Indian Work. And this is true in practically every state in the Union. They established what they call a Department of Indian Work. In the, city of, in the state of Minnesota, there's 27 different denominations held membership on that board of directors, and only one token Indian minister. The total staff of that department was white, middle-class Protestant. In a six-year period, the Minnesota Council of Churches for the Department of Indian Work, exploiting Indian people and showing the conditions that Indian people live under in that state, were able to solicit, and we could prove it because we had input from young ministers that wanted to create change within the church. Then in a six year period, the Minnesota Council of Churches solicited over $10 million to upgrade the conditions of approximately 33,000 Indians. We found out also that no more than $38,000 ever went into this particular department in the state of Minnesota. 
No more than $1,300 in 1968 ever filtered down to the Indian community. And yet today, we don't know where that $1,300 went. So we went to the churches and talked to them. We told them that this was wrong, that in our books, this was fraud. If I went out and said, I'm going to solicit $100,000 for the Lutheran church, and I spend $90,000 of that money on the American Indian movement and give them $10,000, I'd be in jail tomorrow for fraud. So because they would not, at the, at, the, at the time that we confronted them, change that structure and give Indian people 75% control of that board, which was supposed to be an Indian department and a total Indian staff, we threatened a $1 billion lawsuit against the Minnesota Council of Churches. And we could justify every bit of it. $400 million for gross violations of the Ten Commandments, for instance. And we could prove that, too. We could prove that you know, everything that they said in the Ten Commandments, they violated. They said, thou shalt not kill. Colonel Shevington was the man, the great Methodist minister that led the charge at Sand Creek. The American Lutheran Church was the main body in the state of Minnesota that solicited money for Indian programs. None of the money ever got to Indian people. They just built new churches and new schools, laundromats, bowling alleys, and et cetera, insurance companies. They said, thou shalt not steal. If we really take a close look at the history of this country, what happened just 40 years after the pilgrims landed here? What happened to the 56 tribes that were totally erased from the face of the earth just 40 years after the Indian people came out of the woods and saved those people, administered medicine and clothing and shelter and healed them? You look back and you would find out that everything that the churches have today, and everything that this government has, and this system has today, was stolen from the American Indian. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife and the neighbor's goods. You all know about Custer, what kind of man he was. All of these people were supposedly Christian people when they got here. There were people who came here to seek religious freedom. And when the Indian gave them that freedom, they took away our freedom of religion. And this is why we have a so-called Indian problem in America. And after presenting all of the commandments to us, they set aside only one day. It's only down to one hour. For some Christian people, they only spend five or 10 minutes in the church give thanks to God. What they didn't understand about Indian people was the values that we lived under. What they didn't understand about Indian people that anything that we took out of the earth, we must put back. What they didn't understand that one of the greatest values that we had and still have today was to honor our father and our mother. So when we threaten this $1 billion lawsuit, Another 400 million for alienation of ecumenical affections because we can prove how they ripped Indian children off in reservations and sent them to missionary schools throughout the United States and still do it today. We could prove that the American Lutheran Church alone handles over 1,500 adoptions a year of Indian children into white foster homes. When we threaten to expose the churches for everything that they have done and are still doing today in the state of Minnesota and throughout this land, within six months after the formation of the American Indian Movement, the chairman of the Department of Indian Work was Indian, and 75% of the membership of the board of directors was Indian. And the white people that sit on that board today, the ministers, sit on there strictly as advisors to the Indian community. And every penny that they solicit for Indian programs in the state of Minnesota, and we have established the priorities for them, is spent on Indian people today. 
shortly after we had this confrontation with the Minnesota Council of Churches, a young Indian layman came to us and told us about a Luchik meeting in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Lutheran Church and Indian people, they call it. Sioux Falls, South Dakota is where they got together every year, 262 ministers from the three Lutheran synods, the American Lutheran Church, the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, Lutheran Church of America. This is where all the Indian missionaries got together and talked about problems and priorities and programs and established budgets, but the conditions never changed nationally. The conditions never changed. And we went there and we told them that we were all through accepting U.S. clothing, old tennis shoes, mismatched socks, unlabeled canned goods, and etc. But that we did want control over that particular department that they called the Lutheran Church and Indian people that had no Indian people sitting on their board. We presented eight basic challenges for change, eight chances for the church to get back to God through the American Indian movement. We reversed that position and became the missionary to the church to try to save them from the destruction that they are bringing forth. They promised us after three days, we were only there five minutes, and we reversed their whole agenda, took over that meeting and called an Indian caucus on them, and called a press conference and asked Indian people to come in from the whole upper Midwest area to attend that meeting. There's only four Indian people there when we got there. The following day, there was 360 there. They came because they knew that an Indian organization was taking steps to change the conditions that Indian people lived under. And they were not going to take no from the church itself. They promised us that one year from that date, they would furnish us with $4,000 from each one of these synods to fly Indian people in and to pay expenses from Indian people throughout the United States of our selection from reservations, urban settings, and youth to come there and establish a national Indian Lutheran board that we talked about that would someday receive all of the funds that were being solicited to upgrade the conditions of poor people in America, particularly Indians, and that this money would be turned over to us we demanded at that particular point $750,000 a year per Senate for the next 10 years, just as a pilot project to kick this thing off the ground, because we knew that they spent over millions above that mark. One year later, when we met in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, they refused to recognize that particular board. They still wanted to hold on to control of all Indian missionary work in America. So we took a step at that particular point that became known as a very militant, drastic step. Other Indian people condemned us and said it was wrong to do those things. We're no different than the Black Panther Party. That's all we did, nearly, was lock up the dormitory and kicked all the ministers out of it, chained it up and said we we're going to keep it that way. We call a national press conference and expose the church and threaten once again the $1 billion lawsuit. Three days later, we got wires from these three particular synod presidents saying that they would recognize this national Indian Lutheran board. This board to date has only received approximately $240,000. But with Indian people funding that money out to Indian programs throughout the United States last year, we drew $1.5 million in matching funds from the federal government. One of the biggest projects that we funded was the Haskell Institute, as far as change is concerned, long-range goals. We put only $3,500 into that institute. They needed $56,000 to upgrade their library. With help from the Donner Foundation and other denominations, we were able to put together that fund, upgrade that library, and Haskell Institute has become a junior college. These are the things that we feel must be done by Indian people today, that we must assume complete control 
over our own destiny. And these are the steps that the American Indian Movement is taking and will continue to take. In March of 1969, I was called into Denver, Colorado to request that the American Indian Movement, because of the name that we were gaining at that particular point, history, we were called into Denver, Colorado to help initiate a class action complaint and suit that was filed there against the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Knowing how successful it has been in the past to grab control over various billings that belong to Indian people to begin with, we did the same thing in Denver, Colorado. We locked up the Bureau of Indian Affairs office and kicked out the 120 white employees that were employed there. We supported the 13 Indian employees that filed the suit. And we demanded to speak at that time with the Secretary of Interior, and the Commissioner of Indian Affairs. And we presented 17 basic challenges and demands for change nationally in the Bureau of Indian Affairs structure. Because they didn't react right away at that particular point after holding it for one complete week, I went back to Minneapolis and just drawing you know, from various friends throughout the country, we were able to gain control of nine area offices the following Monday. Many of the challenges and demands that were presented at that point have been met, are being met today within the Interior and Bureau of Indian Affairs structure itself. We have initiated, as of January 3rd, I guess the ultimate plan as far as education is concerned. For three solid years, we have kicked curriculum out of the school system in the state of Minnesota. For three solid years, we had all Indian grand jury hearings in regards to discrimination, and brutality, and assault cases within the public school system. For three solid years, we pulled out movies, slides, books such as the Minnesota story that depicted Indian people as savages, heathens, drunks, lazy. For three solid years, we stopped plays on Thanksgiving. For three solid years, we participated in human relations courses with the schools and sensitized them to the needs of Indian students. For three solid years, over $10 million came into the city of Minneapolis for educational programs for Indian students. And for three solid years, they had an Indian Upward Bound, a STAIRS program, students trained area Indian resident students, student dropout prevention programs, student support programs. And for three solid years, the dropout rate has stayed the same. On January 3rd, the American Indian Movement, without a penny, opened an all-Indian school in the city of Minneapolis. We started out with three Indian students that were pulled out of school when we grabbed the Naval Air Station and tried to win that federal surplus land to an urban Indian school and college. And this man refused to let his kids go back to the public school system. And they threaten them weekly. If you don't have your child, your children in here by Monday morning, you're going to jail. They charge them with contributing to delinquency of minors, threaten them with $50 or 15 days. We hired attorneys. And they told us that we had to find something else for these three students or this young man was going to jail. So without trying to go into the churches anymore or going to the federal government office of education and trying to solicit funds for an all Indian school, we decided to start it with nothing because we believe that Indian people can do that. As far back in time as we can go, the Indian people have always survived the past. We started an all Indian school on January 3rd. On Monday morning with three Indian boys. Young boys, the oldest one was 12 years of age. The following Friday, we had 36 Indian students. Today we have 58 Indian students. We have no room for any more. We have 22 standing by. 
We have an Indian school start. We call it the American Indian Movement Survival School because that is exactly what it is. We're providing survival for these children that they've been kicking out of the public school system all these years and putting into correctional institutions throughout the state of Minnesota. We're providing all Indian curriculum for the students. The Bureau of Indian Affairs has finally announced their support of this program. They've found ways and means of channeling money all of a sudden into an urban setting. And the only way they can do it is saying that the American Indian Movement is developing curriculum for our schools our 230 schools that have failed all these years. So we are receiving money. We have opened a school in Cleveland, Ohio, one in Denver, Colorado, one in Milwaukee at the Naval Air the Coast Guard Station that we hold there, and one in St. Paul, Minnesota. We have a total enrollment today of over 450 students. All 450 of these students that are enrolled in this school would either be in a foster home, on probation, are committed to an institution because these are the only students that we are dealing with. We're not encouraging Indian people to drop out of the public school system. If they are making it there, if they are happy, they can stay. We are taking those that they consider a problem child, those they consider a juvenile delinquent, those they consider scholastically retarded in one way or the other. And to date, of the 34 Indian students that have been referred to us to the, the Minneapolis court system and juvenile court, we haven't had one violate that trust of the American Indian movement. We feel that this is the ultimate answer. It's a plan that we have drawn and put forth, had endorsed and adopted by the National Congress, by every major Indian organiza organization in the United States but yet could not receive federal funding for it because they discourage every way possible Indian self-determination in America. But we know that we're going to win. We know that there's a long battle ahead. We know that probably the first incorporators, organizers of the American Indian movement will not see the change that we talk about and plan today. But we know today that something has been done. We know today that something can be done if Indian people get together, particularly the urban Indian. If they get together and, and you know and forget about all forget all about this thing that I'm a Sioux and you're a Chippewa and you know we're supposed to be traditional enemies and you know we just can't work together. They'll forget that they're a Navajo or a Pueblo and start thinking of themselves as Indian people and get together as organizations. They can create that change anywhere in America. It's been proven. It's been proven in 24 different places today. 24 different places where they have an American Indian movement chapter, something good has happened there. Indian people have proven that it can be done. We're only a little over three and a half years old. We have three more chapters right now forming. One in Kansas City, one in the Haskell Institute, one is supposedly going to form in San Jose. We just organized one recently in Alberta, Canada. It's become an international type thing. It's considered the fastest growing movement in America today, bar any color or creed. And we know that the things that are happening today with the formation of the Legal Rights Center, the formation of the Housing Co-op in Minneapolis, the formation of the Multi-Service Indian Center that we have planned, all the things that have happened and are happening today, we are finding out by the traditionalists, by the medicine people, that it's been prophesied. <laughs> American Indian movement today journeys, you know, back to the reservation many times. Seven of our chapters are located on reservation today. So it's not an organization just concerned about urban Indian problems. It's an organization concerned and fighting to upgrade the conditions of Indian people no matter where they live. It's an organization that is committed to go into any area, any reservation, any setting and community in the United States 
whether tribal government invites us there or not, as long as there's one Indian person suffering in that community of being discriminated against one way or the other, we have a commitment to go in there and to protect that citizen's rights as Indian people. We have the same commitment today that many of our great leaders of the past have had. We are trying to accomplish today what people like Tecumseh, Pontiac, Day, Crazy Horse, Setting Bull, Black Hawk, all of these other great chiefs that talked about unity, tribes coming together to make a stand. In the state of Minnesota, we helped initiate just two years ago. People said our treaties will never be heard in court. Our hunting and fishing and ricing rights, the rights that we set aside for ourselves through treaties would never be returned to us. Two years ago, we helped initiate a suit against the state of Minnesota, attacking Public Law 280, asking that the hunting, fishing, and gathering of wild rice be returned and restricted only for Indian people. On December 10th, the United States government, the United States District Attorney, entered a suit on behalf of the Minnesota Chippewa tribe against the state of Minnesota, saying that the state violated this federal trust that the Indian had with the federal government. The United States District Attorney and the Bureau of Indian Affairs supported the Indian people. On December 10th, a federal ruling was handed down, Minneapolis Federal District Court, returning the hunting, fishing, and gathering of wild rice back to the Minnesota Chippewa tribe. Just two, hour, two hours after this decision was handed down, the state of Minnesota and the resorters and the John Birch Society, the state of Minnesota appealed that decision. Now this is the same thing they have done in Washington. It's the same thing that has been done in Wisconsin. It's the same thing that has been done in Michigan and other parts of the United States where federal rulings have been handed down favoring Indian people. And this is their process of tying us up in a judicial process for another three, four, 15, or 20 years of court battles because they can go to the circuit courts and Supreme Courts and et cetera and appeal in these cases and decisions. In retaliation, the American Indian Movement supported the Leech Lake Band of Chippewa Indians who formulated a national boycott against the Leech Lake reservation businesses. We pulled over $4 million so far out of the banks in the Walker Cass Lake area of tribal, federal, Head Start monies, et cetera, such as that. We refused to trade in any of these stores on the reservation. May 10th, fishing season opens up the Leech Lake Reservation. Leech Lake is considered the musky capital of the world. People come from Europe and all over to fish there. The reservation asked that that business committee, tribal council, asked the American Indian Movement for national support so far to date, we're the only ones that have announced that national support. And as of May 10, opening day of fishing season, the Leech Lake Indian Reservation will be blockaded and closed down completely. The mayor of Cass Lake, the mayor of Walker, the police chief, the city council, the John Birch Society, and people like this have came out and made public statements that they wouldn't want to be responsible for any Indian that drives into town with a deer strapped to his car. And that if the American Indian movement goes through with supporting this blockade of highways and boycott, support of this particular tribe who has asked our support nationally, unanimously, there's going to be a lot of good Indians in the Leech Lake Indian Reservation. But we know they're scared. We know they're uptight. 
one thing we have found out about history and, and you know American history in the books, in the movies, in the mass media, the white people are scared of hell, the Indians. They've been taught that. You know. They've been taught that if they ever ride out into the prairie in, or into Indian country, you know, the always best best thing for them to do, especially if they had women folk along. That they must reserve one bullet for themselves, you know, in case they're captured, they don't want to be tortured by Indians, so they shoot themselves. And this is what they've been drilled into their minds all these years. <laughs> so we know they're uptight up there. If they weren't, they wouldn't be making all of these statements on what's going to happen to Indian people up there on May 10th. The fact is that the injunction was lifted last Wednesday. Indian people are hunting and fishing on that reservation. But I guess the national boycott blockade is going to bring this all to a head. We are using this particular issue in the state of Minnesota. I guess it could be used in Pitt River and Four Corners or any other place in the United States where Indian people live. But we are using this particular issue because the federal government has supported the tribe and because the Bureau of Indian Affairs is involved and because we finally got the United States government and the Bureau of Indian Affairs trapped. We're going to use this particular issue to focus in on Indian problems throughout the United States. And there will be literature and newsletters and et cetera coming out shortly asking for national support on this particular boycott. Now, probably that this appeal will be dropped before then, but now the other six reservations in the state of Minnesota are demanding the same. My home reservation is demanding the same. We're demanding all law enforcement section of that treaty be enforced and that this all be turned over to the Indian people. As of May 10th, they are breaking every lease of every resort on the Leech Lake Indian Reservation. The American Lutheran Church, because it has a responsibility to answer to the challenges that were established and set forth in 1968 and 69 and 70, because they have passed resolution after resolution from seven major denominations in the United States honoring these challenges, they are, we have them, given us national support from the white community today honoring of this treaty. They've lost land sales up there. A couple of the businesses have closed down. And just recently, we established a national office in Washington, D.C. We found out that five of the biggest businessmen turned out to be five of the biggest racists in Cass Lake. And every one of these businesses have been receiving small business association loans out of Washington, D.C., what they have been doing for the last four years is hiring young Indian students on stipends and training them to work in stores, training them as cashiers, and et cetera. And right before their six-week period is up in this training process, they find reason to fire and rehire another one on a stipend. This is more exploitation that we have just uncovered on that reservation, and we filed an injunction and stopped every one of those loans from going in there. We have found out one thing, that the only way that we can hurt the white people is right back here in their pocketbook. It's the only thing that they understand. That's the only security that they have today. And we have utilized this particular way of doing things in many parts of the upper Midwest. I was telling the students this morning about a situation we had over in Sand Lake, Wisconsin. They have a little tribe there. It's very small. It's only about approximately uh, 1,200 Chippewa Indians belong to that tribe. It's called the last tribe of the Chippewa Nation. In the Cumberland School District, for 10 solid years, they have been discriminating against Indian students. For 10 solid years, they haven't had a graduate student from that school district. We found out about six months ago that over $250,000 in federal monies was going into that school district to upgrade the educational levels of the young students there. Now, they had complaints dating back 10 years, you know, where they couldn't even get on a bus without being spit at. You'd think you were in Mississippi because the Indian students had to file to the back of the bus and be spit and slapped and had their hair pulled. The latest incident that happened there happened six months ago. Where they took a young Indian girl down, only 13 years of age, Real long hair, all the way back down to her, in her back. They took her right down on the bus and cut all her hair out. 
Her brother-in-law at that time was chairman of the American Indian Movement, Don Redhorse. We called a meeting with the school board on a Saturday, and we give them until Wednesday to file these charges or back these charges that we made. We give them until Wednesday to fire that school bus driver. We give them until Wednesday to initiate some plan to place Indian people on that school board. We give them to Wednesday to either hire Indian teachers in that school district or, or hire counselors. We give them to Wednesday to establish an Indian Studies Department. We give them to Wednesday to try to start spending that $245,000 that they're receiving for Indian education on Indian students. Or we were going to boycott that school completely and pull the 67 Indian students out of there and ask for a federal investigation. Today they have a brand new school bus. They have an Indian driving that school bus. You know, they don't come out and shoot at their homes or kill their dogs anymore with guns. They treat the Indian students real well. Every time we have a power in Minneapolis, we call up the Cumberland School and say, hey, we'll send your, your troop up here having a power this weekend. They hustle them all up there, you know, buy them lunch, put them up for the night. They treat them real nice. You know? And this thing can be done anywhere where federal money is being spent. And then people do have power. They have power wherever federal programs are being used in America. It's just a matter of organizing and going after that money. I just, uh, I've been visiting quite a bit lately, and several members of the American Indian Movement have been visiting with a young. Indian medicine men on the Rosebud Indian Reservation by the name of Leonard Crowdog. If you ever met Leonard Crowdog or talked to him and have read the book Black Elk Speaks, you would think that you were meeting Black Elk all over again. There have been six different medicine men from the Rosebud Indian Reservation in Pine Ridge who have endorsed and supported the American Indian Movement in the past two years. During our national conference in October, we established a national AIM board of directors and picked Russell Means as our national coordinator, who's no Kalala Sioux, and Dennis Banks as a national director, who is Chippewa. We knew that some of the things that Leonard Kodak talked about and the things that Black Elk talked about and some of our own medicine men in the state of Minnesota were finally coming forth. We knew that there was a prophecy, and the prophecy has been retold to us many times in the past two years. That's been handed down from generation to generation. Nobody knows how old the prophecy really is, but they do know it was here a long time before the white man got here. In the Sioux prophecy, they talked about the white man. There was only Indian people here then, but they knew that there were four colors here on Mother Earth. Every time they stand up, the peace pipe, and offer it to the four winds, four directions, they also offer the peace pipe in honor of the four races of mankind because they knew that someday they would all be here in America, here in Indian land. They talked about the first coming of the white man. They said that he would stay for a very short period of time, hardly pollute the land and would leave. Of course, when I was growing up in this missionary school where they sent me away, they never told me anything like this. They had me believing, actually, that Columbus, you know, people like that discovered America. They had me believing that George Washington, because he cut down a cherry tree, became the father of the country. We got an Indian organization by the name of Dennis Banks, who's been married eight times, you know, seven times, and has 18 kids, so I can doubt that very much. George Washington's father of the country. Well, that's what they said. 
they talked about, you know, unless you, when I went to this missionary school, they told me that unless I became like the white man, you know, they used to put the little white shirt and bow tie on me even. Finally, when I was about nine years old, I rejected it all. I couldn't stand it. You know, stand up to the blackboard every Monday morning because I didn't go to church and I couldn't take that ruler anymore. <laughs> they used to crack me the ruler and finally, when I was about nine years old, I finally punched a nun in the stomach and they sent me to Red Wing State Training School. <laughs> but I guess I rejected it quite early in life. And I had spent a little over 14 years of my life in correctional institutions since then. And that's about the only education I got. They talked about in the prophecy that the second coming of the white man, and they've always had me believe in that white was right. You know, unless you became white like them, you'd never make it. But they said the second coming of the white man, that his skin would be so pale, it would be white as death, because that's what they would be bringing with them. They talked about the diseases that would be foreign to us at that time, but yet the Indian would find medicine to survive. They said that they would come here, you know, because they had turmoil on the other side of the water. That they would be coming here and they would be begging and asking the Indian for help and support. So they would be so sick that most of them would die and perish the first year here. But they said that the Indian would come out of the woods because that's the kind of people Indians are. Anybody that is hurting were willing to help them that we would come out of the woods and we would offer them medicine. We would show them the herbs that must be used to cure various sicknesses. We would come out of the woods and we would heal. We'd show them how to build their homes, how to plant their crops, what berries to eat, how to insulate their homes for the cold. And after giving them everything that we had, they knew in the prophecy that these same people would turn against us and take away everything we had. And for four generations, the prophecy said, Indian people would suffer here in America. They said that the buffalo would disappear before our very eyes. That has happened. They said that the deer and the antelope would run and hide. That has happened. In the state of Minnesota, they didn't have a deer hunting season last year for the first time in history because of scarcity of deer. They said that the giver of life, the creator, the sun, would be unable to see the fish in the water. So they knew all about pollution. They said that these same people that came here and called us heathens, the same people that came here and told us that we were wrong, that we had many gods would split and divide. Today we have 33 major denominations in America, and every one of them have a different concept of God or how to get to heaven, yet they still call us heathens. They said that students would descend from the higher schools of learning. And that has happened too. And finally they said that the eagle the greatest symbol of all, of protectiveness, brotherhood, and love. The greatest religious symbol of all would be attacked by the white man. That too has happened. They said the conditions would be the same as they were in the 1600s when Indian people came out of the woods and saved them. Leonard Crow Dog believes that that day is here. They said when all of these conditions were the same as they were in the early 1600s when Indian people came out of the woods and saved those white people, they said little fires would burn again. They talked about the fifth generation. We are there. The conditions are the same. And we sincerely believe today that the American Indian movement are the little fires that they talked about that would burn again. These are the same people, no different than the ones that came out of the woods and tried to offer a better way of life, offer the same freedom that America doesn't have today. 
we feel today that the American Indian movement is a very spiritual movement. Black Elk was the man. He wrote a book about him called Black Elk Speaks, published in 1935. John Nyer, the author. Only today, in this day and time, is that particular book becoming a bestseller. Nobody paid attention to it before. College students are picking them up by the thousands throughout the United States and reading that book and trying to understand Indian people. They're dropping out of the higher schools of learning. They're growing their hair along and putting on a vest and beadwork and buckskin boots and trying to be like an Indian. We believe today, the American Indian movement believes today that we must assume our role in America. We must fully understand that we as Indian people are the landlords that we are still the landlords here in America. And that's the end of the month. The rent is due. And we are here to collect. Thank you. Is there any questions? <clears throat> no, there's a lot of uh, different areas and things that I... I didn't talk about it. There's so many things happening today. It's almost impossible to go into everything, and it seems like we always forget something. There are some AIM people here today, and or tonight, and I'm, I'm sure that you know they want want to tell you uh, uh, about their particular problems in their area and some of the the things that the Bureau of Indian Affairs has let happen to them in the past years and what they are doing to to change that. Uh, if you have any questions for myself, uh, please feel free to to answer them. I must have some questions. Let's know it all. How many uh, We have none on the West Coast. We have none uh, here. Well, we have one in, that just opened up in, uh, one in uh, Arizona. We've had some requests from different people, but. Uh, California. But uh, on the way back east, he was going to stop there at the school. Uh, so his brother, Ted Kennedy, uh, instead took his place and he came to the school and he spoke to our first uh, graduating class uh, of that school. These are eighth graders. We had 25 eighth graders graduating at the time. And then he uh, felt uh, the school important enough to come to the school and to uh, support that school. And since that time, he's been back, I don't know how many times, with other senators also to that school. And we have a lot of congressmen, we have uh, top educators throughout the country come to that school to see the school run by Indians. And they were amazed that uh, the school board members who don't speak English at all are running the school. They make decisions, they, they, as, as I said before, they hire and fire teachers. And uh, this is a great school. Let me just mention briefly what they have. Besides having an all Indian staff and having an all Indian school board, they have uh, they invite parents from the Hogans. The Hogan is a uh, you know I don't know you know what a Hogan is. That's the, the dwelling that the, the, the Navajo people live in, the traditional Navajos. And these are the kind of people that are now involved in the school. And what happens is these parents go to the school and they actually sit in the classroom. And through interpretation, they tell the teacher, look, you're teaching the kids the wrong concept of either math or science. Or They tell the teacher, this is the way that kids will be best taught. So through interpretation, these traditional parents go to the classroom and they tell the teacher uh, a, a technique, a method, a way that they should approach a certain uh, subject. So they are involved. And they don't get paid for this. The doors are open to any parent to come to the school anytime he or she feels like it. And go into a classroom to observe or to participate, whatever you know is necessary for them to participate. And then they are trained. These parents, if, if they want to, are trained about uh, school policies, the school laws, regulations, and education throughout the country. 
and everything they wanted to know about education is taught to them at that school through what we call adult education program, ABE, basic adult education. And they learn everything from writing their own name to learning about cents and ten cents and nickel dollar change and, and about the world in general. About a little bit about science and how to deal with uh, an Anglo person. Uh, learn about uh, the prices of foods and, and uh, you know, because the traders on that reservation just uh, hijack their prices so high that they keep the Indian people, uh, every time that the uh, Indian people get their checks every month, the traders just take the whole check. And the Indian people never see one cent of their check, you know, they don't even receive one cent of their the paycheck. So they learn about the food prices, they learn about laws, their rights, legal rights as citizens of the United States, all these things. And they're being educated without, you know, actually going to enroll in the school. Right there in, in the school, they're taught these things. And then to take advantage of their skills and, and craftsmanship, they, they come in, they have a class where they can make saddles. When they make saddles, th these can be sold to anybody that wants to buy a saddle. To white people, to Indian people, tourists that come around in that area. And they're taught to make jewelry. And, and they in turn can uh, sell the jewelry that they make. And they can make the money off of what they make. So these Indian people are slowly coming to the school now and slowly participating in the school which has been denied to them, uh, as you know, if you don't think about Indian history. Too long, BIA, their method of teaching has been to, you know, we don't want parents coming to the school. And, and, and they have tried to, all through these years, Americanize Indian students. In other words, quote, civilize. I don't know what that term means, but the BIA, their philosophy has been to Take the Indians off the reservation and make Anglos out of them, make a white man out of them. This has been their philosophy. And Rough Rock broke that tradition. Rough Rock said to BIA, look, we want our kids to learn about Navajo leaders as well as about George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, all these great American leaders that we have in history. So right now Rough Rock is teaching these Navajo students, Narbona, Manuelito, all the great leaders we have in our own tribe. There there have been some great ones of other tribe. Like Chief uh, uh, the Chief City and Bull, Red Cloud and all these other great chiefs that like Crazy Horse and so on. We have in our own tribe uh, some great ones. So the kids learn about these various great leaders in, in the Navajo history as well as about Lincoln and about the development of our country. They learn about the development of their own country, which is the reservation. So it's uh, what we call bicultural. In other words, you learn about the white way of life and then you learn about your own way of life, your own history as well as an American history. This is called bicultural. And the kids are being taught this. And then Rough Rock said, it's unfair just to teach the Indian students English. Let's teach them their own language. So Rough Rock initiated a program called bilingual education, which is to say the kids are being taught Navajo as well as English. Right on from at the start of preschool age, the kids are learning to read and write Navajo before they are taught English. And gradually English is introduced. So in essence, they're getting English and Navajo. They're learning how to, to write and read Navajo as well as learning how to speak English. So this bilingual thing, learning English in the Navajo language. So this has been initiated at Rough Rock. So great things are now happening as a result of these various experiments and, and demonstration. It's been found that uh, by introducing Navajo to these uh, preschool kids, 
they learn English faster. If you teach a kid their own language first, you know, they kind of uh, pick up English faster than the, than you would if you introduced English when they first came into school because these kids are like their parents. They've never spoke English at all. And then uh, when they, their first day at school, the only language they know is their own mother tongue, which is the Navajo language. And, and uh, BIA, uh, as I mentioned before, has been teaching just straight English. They didn't want the kids to, to, to talk in their native tongue at school. I remember when I went to a boarding school. A boarding school is just a federal school that uh, the Indian parents place their kids in this boarding school, and then they never see them again until the kid uh, gets out of school in May. I went through this boarding school, and because of transportation, uh, I never saw my parents for the nine months I went to school. And we have these boarding schools still existing on our reservation, as well as on uh, some of the other reservations throughout the country, where they take these 13-year-old uh, students and ship them 500 miles, even to 1,000 miles away from home in a place where the kid has been nev never been to and to a place that uh, the kid, uh, you know, a student, a typical Indian student uh, in a boarding school like Shimawa, uh, Inner Mountain School, here in California, Riverside uh, School, these kids, do, that's a boarding school, off-reservation boarding school. I went to boarding schools for six or seven years before I went to a public school. And I remember my teacher telling me, you know, uh, don't talk Navajo. If we did, we, we get punished. I remember staring at the wall, you know, uh, for seven or eight hours one day because I spoke my own language. That's how strict it was in BIA boarding school. Another time I remember eating soap, a big bar of soap, because I learned, I mean, because I was speaking my own tongue, a Navajo language. And this is how strict the teachers were. They didn't want us to speak English, and they wanted to Americanize us, uh, you know, learn about the, the white way of life. They used to tell us, you're medicine man, your way of life, your traditions, your scenes, your ceremonies are no good. Forget it, you know. Forget you're an Indian, in other words. And this is what I was taught in this boarding school. I was punished for that. But today, that's all changed. And Rough Rock is one of the schools that led the way in this breakthrough. They reversed that tradition. They are now teaching the kids to speak their own tongue as well as English, learning English, and then to, to learn about their own history as well as learn about American history. So it's a reversal of the philosophy of BIA. And BIA is now convinced that that's the way, that's an approach to teach Indian kids. And right now, throughout BIA schools, they are now introducing this the Navajo language in their school. And they're introducing this Navajo culture, Indian history in their schools. You've never heard of, you know, this five or even ten years ago. But right now, BIA is convinced that that is the way to teach Indians, to instill pride into Indian students about their own history and their own language, that their language is something great, that their culture is something great. And it's a complete reversal of that philosophy. And BIA has taken up that philosophy and they're teaching Indian kids now. They're asking for federal money. Every When I was back in Washington, D.C., there's a place called a, a Bilingual Education, Title VII. I don't know if you've heard of this, where uh, Mexican-Americans can learn how to speak their own native tongue, Spanish, as well as English. If, if an Indian tribe wants to uh, teach their kids their native tongue, as well as English, they apply uh, propose, you know, on, on, a, on a paper application to, to the government saying we want so much money to uh, start this program in our school. When I was back in Washington, D.C., this is what happened. We uh, receive a lot of applications from all over the country saying that uh, we want Indian language taught in our school. 
for these kids. So this is uh, a movement in itself all over the country now. You talk about uh, black studies, the black people want in black studies. Now the Indians are uh, saying uh, similar things like we want Indian studies. No one really knows what Indian studies comprise, but yet it's, it's, caught, it's caught on with the people. They want to study about their own people as well as uh, the white people and other people. So this is what's happening. And when I was in Washington, D.C., Senator Kennedy introduced a bill called the Comprehensive Indian Education Bill. I don't know if you've heard of it. But what, Senator Kennedy? Established what he called a National Board of uh, Regents. I should put Indian in here. He wanted to uh, change the whole structure of Indian education. In his bill, he said that uh, there should be established a National Indian Board of Regents, which will set policies for all Indian education pertaining to federal schools, public schools, and private schools. In other words, these 15 Indian members of this board will make all decisions for education of Indian children throughout the country. And I was fortunate enough to uh, get acquainted with the senator and, and kind of help him uh, with this bill, make amendments. And one thing that I didn't like in his bill was he proposed giving more money to the public schools that have Indian students, which is have, which we already have now. A lot of these public schools are receiving money, but it's a misuse of federal funds. Last year, there was an investigation of the misuse of federal funds, and we found out that a lot of these schools are not educating the you know, giving proper education to these Indian kids. Instead, they use the money to buy school buses, new school buses, new football equipment, new band instruments, carpet the whole school. They did everything else except to educate the Indian students in their school. So we went around the country, you know, investigating this type of uh, circumstances, and we discovered a lot of school districts were in this category where they miss use the federal funds to buy their own school equipment. So Senator Kennedy was saying that let's give more money to these public schools that have Indian kids. And we said at the time, hold it, you know, wait a minute. That's happening now, and these schools are misusing the funds. Why give them more money to make them rich, richer, you know? So that is one thing I did not like. So I said to the senator, why not Instead of going through the various, uh, you know, states, the 50 states, where there are Indian people in the states, instead of giving money to the states, why not give the money directly to Indian tribes and to Indian agencies and Indian research centers and give them money directly without going through the states and let them spend these federal monies for, the, for their own programs. And this is one change we made in that bill. He was willing to give the money to the states and let the states, anytime uh, some Indian money is going through the states, it's all cut up in uh, bureaucracy and, and it never, all these Indian people in the states never receive a penny. If they do, it doesn't get to them. Instead, there's a lot of equipment purchased by the school. So we said to Senator Kennedy, why not give it directly to the tribes? In other words, in our tribe, the Navajo tribe, we have what we call, uh, we have our own Indian Education Department, Department of Education. If this bill should pass, this means that we can get money as a tribe through our Education Department from the government directly without going through the states. And then we can use these monies to run elementary schools, secondary schools, and other innovative programs on our reservation. This is all it means. This is one change we made. And this bill is now pending in the Congress. It, there's a lot more to, the, to, to it than what I just mentioned. This is basically what it is. What's that bill number? 
I can't remember. I should have. I have some copies that in my home, but I didn't bring any. But basically, this is what he's trying to do: is creation of this national board of Indians, which will make all policies and regulations for Indian schools, whether they be private and federal and pr uh, public schools. So uh, I wish I had more. Well, I shouldn't say more time, but I. Uh, Maybe in the other class, I might go into deeper into this bill and others that I, you know, that the kids may want to hear. But I thank you again for this opportunity and good luck in your studies. Thank you very much. Okay, gang. Storms, uh, winter storms, like during this time of year. Thank you. I have some materials here that you may want to have. At the end of the discussion, this tells about the uh, program at BYU, uh, the Indian Education Program at BYU. When I was at this university way back in '63, we only had 15 to 20 Indian students. Now there's over uh, 500 Indian students. You can see the tremendous enrollment of Indian students. And you may ask yourself, why this tremendous enrollment at this university? And these are Indian students uh, coming from all different tribes throughout the country. We have kids from North Carolina, the Lumbee Indians. We have kids from back east. We have kids from the Midwest, the Plains Indians. Even kids from Canada, the Blood Indians, and various tribes from there. And we have some kids from California, and it's all over, Southwest. Uh, and we, I think, have over 50 different Indian tribes here at BYU. And of course, the majority of the Indian students are Navajo students. Uh, this, the reason being that the Navajo tribe is the largest tribe in the United States right now, with the largest reservation in the United States. And their reservation is uh, no more than 500 miles from this uh, institution, BYU. Uh, when I say Brigham Young University, I don't know what comes to your mind. You may think, ah, that's a, a Mormon institution, that's a Mormon university, and then you might say, it's like some of the Indian students, uh, uh, don't they have a, a program called the Indian Placement Program? I, I, I just want to know what, what what comes to your mind, you know, when you hear, hear BYU, you know? Shirt and tie. What? Shirt and tie. Shirt and tie? What else? Because I want to kind of clear up, you know, some of uh, the misconceptions that uh, you people might have about this institution. Because uh, we do receive a lot of criticism, you know, from Indian people, from black people, from all people uh, about uh, this institution. Uh, so I'm just kind of curious, you know, to, to see what you, what comes to your mind when I say uh, I'm from Brigham Young University, you know, and we have over 500 Indian students. You know, why the tremendous enrollment at this school of Indian students? Do we have to be a member of the church to go to that school or we can... That's a good question. You don't have to be a member of the church to, to go there. For instance, uh, a lot of Indian kids that go there are not members of the Mormon church. There is no stipulation that says you have to be a member. So it's open to any person that's willing to come to that university. And a lot of non-Indians are non-Mormons. Uh, am I wrong in, in assuming that BYU is, is uh, straight laced and that uh, as well as campus life, uh, culturally they, they tend to run your, run your life off campus as well? I mean, like, I visited my brother up there at the Air Force Base and uh, uh, they seem to roll the streets up there fairly, and uh, you abide by these rules. First of all, when you apply to BYU, you agree to uphold the standards at BYU, which is no smoking, uh, you know, the uh, liquor and cigarettes and these kind of things, you know, you don't do on campus. And as a result, you don't see any students right now if you should go there. A student smoking or a student, uh, you know, having booze or all booze that we're having a hangover, you know. But we do have these problems. Uh, even though we have these standards, these kids do have these problems, you know. And they probably do it on weekends or even during the nights. But uh, it's kind of, uh, 
it's not mandatory, you know, that you keep these things, that you keep these standards, but you do say before you apply that you, you will uphold these standards. And all the Indian kids, as well as non-Indians, uh, agree to do the same thing, that they will abide by these uh, standards. Does that kind of answer your question? Yes, <laughs> But, uh, you know, no student is forced to do anything. He, he goes there, he can quit the next month or the next, uh, as soon as the semester is up. You know, if he doesn't like it, then he can ship out, you know. That's his, uh, he has a, a free will and freedom to do that, you know, so he's not restricted to, to stay there. If you're unsatisfied, great, you know, then maybe you're happy at Cal State or some other university, you know, and so you go there. So it's just uh, an open thing. There's no restrictions, but you only on the standards that you agree to uphold the standards and no student is forced to go to church this is all up to the individual we have what we call right now we have three in the wards meaning that we have three uh, kind of a uh, wards for Indian students to go to and the, and, and uh, these wards are run by Indian bishops you know in the church and Indian counselors and all the Indian kids, not I shouldn't say all, most of them go to one of these three Indian wards. But they're not, again, pressured to attend church. It's all up to them. And then uh, they can go to non-Indian wards also. You know, there's a lot of wards on campus. They can go to an Indian ward or if they want to go to a white ward, fine. It's all up to them. So it's these things are available to them. They can take advantage of, of them, or if they don't wish to, then they can also. Any other questions? Can you get by like this? Do they pressure you to... Uh... One of the standards, again, besides cigarettes and liquor, is that, uh, you know, your parents, you know, it, it should be in a way that's acceptable you know, and representable. In other words, uh, long hair is allowed, but not clear down your back or to your shoulder, you know, it's, and then uh, you're required kind of to uh, dress neat, you know, uh, meaning that uh, Levi's are okay at uh, maybe athletic events, but not to go to school. So you don't, well, you do see kids wearing Levi's. Uh, for instance, a lot of Indian students wear boots and Levi's and traditional clothes on reservation, but they wear it, so there's uh, nothing like that saying that you can't wear boots or Levi's, you know. It's just that, just so you're neat and acceptable, you know, this, this type of uh, an atmosphere. Is there a high percentage of conversion among Indian people? No, not really. Uh, a lot of these non-Indian kids that come here, non-Mormon, at the end of the year, go back to Mormon. You know, in the process, they they become members of the church, but they're not forced to join the church. Again, they like what they see. They like the activities. They like the Indian program there, and they like uh, the philosophy, the teachings of the church, and on their own initiative, they 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 wish they express you know their their to be taught and to and to you know of course baptize the church again it's all on the students during the course of the year they're not forced in any way to accept or to be brought into the church mm -hmm. just to not to be facetious but just to give a little bit of background on you you convert yeah i was converted in fact i don't know if you've heard of this uh Mormon Indian placement program where Indian kids are placed into Mor white Mormon homes. Have you heard of this program before? I was one of those. Uh, I, in fact, I stayed with a white family for nine years uh, away from my parents. I stayed with this white family. And now they're like my own family. I love them, I accept them. No. Uh, in a sense, I have two families my natural one and this white foster families. And I went to that home when I was uh, 10 years of age. And again, we hear criticisms from Indian militants and other people uh, saying that the church is forcing Indian kids you know, into these homes. And that uh, once the kids go to these homes, 
uh, they're forced to forget about their identity, forget that, you know, they, they're taught to forget their Indians. This is not true. When I was uh, in that foster home, uh, I was taught to be proud of my heritage. Be proud that you're an Indian. My fa foster parents told me at the time, you know, we want to help you in every way we can so you can, uh, you know, have an equal education, equal right, you know, to for jobs and employment and education in every way. And this is exactly what happened, you know, and, and uh, I, I kind of followed their counsel, wise counsel. This doesn't mean that I went to that home to forget my parents, my natural parents on a reservation. And, and it didn't mean for me to forget that I'm an Indian. In fact, they reinforced that I was an Indian, you know. And they said that uh, we want to help you um, to realize who you are, first of all, an Indian. They have another term that they use, a Lamanite. They don't use, they don't, you say Indian, you're a Lamanite, which means we have this Book of Mormon. I think you've all heard of it, Book of Mormon. In there is a history of Indian people. We know in our church who we really are. We know why we were here first before Columbus came, where we came from. It's not so much across the Bering Strait, as some anthropologists say. We know, uh, of, you know, through the Book of Mormon, where we came from, and that we were here before the advent of the white settlers and everything else. So, so these kids are being taught these things. They know who they are, they're proud of it, and then when they graduate, they go back and help their people, like myself. I went back to Rough Rock to help my own people, set up that school. And Rough Rock, as you know, is... Uh, made some uh, national headlines, you know, in education, in an education. And, and uh, so I went there and then I went back to school and I went back to Washington, D.C. And last year I was Washington, D.C. and I traveled all over the country helping in the tribes. And uh, it's interesting, you know, as I go around to these various reservations, Indian people will come up to me and say, you're a Navajo, aren't you? And I say, yes. And say, what are you doing here? You know, you're... Why don't you go back to and help your own tribe? You know, they were amazed to know that an Indian from another tribe is trying to help all tribes. You know, in this foster home and in this church, we're taught to the point where, you know, we're concerned about not only Indian people, mm -hmm. but we're concerned about white people. These kids are taught not to uh, cause hatred or contention, not to hate any person. Not to hate uh, white men, you know, that this land belonged to everybody. Because of the Book of Mormon in there, it said, you know, that the, the Lord or God does not, you know, favor one people. They don't favor white people or they don't, he doesn't favor Indian people over white. You know, this type of teaching, you know. So it develops in you uh, a concern for the welfare of all mankind. Indian people, white people, black people, Chinese people, any people that exists on this earth as a child of God. You see people in terms of he or she being a child of God. And this is the way they're taught. And, and, and through this process, you begin to see, you know, uh, uh, the problems of uh, needs of all people, not any one particular race. But the kids are especially taught to be concerned more so about their own people because the Indian people really do need help. They have more problems. They really need, that's where the help is needed. So, therefore, when I get through, I'll be involved in Indian education. I'll be helping all Indian people. But this doesn't mean I'm restricting myself to helping Indian people. If the occasion permits, I'm willing to help anyone, any race, white people, as well as Indian people. So these kids are given this foundation, and when they get through, they're aware. You know, they don't have these uh, a lot of these hang-ups that a lot of non-Indians and mm -hmm. Indian kids have about life, the purpose in life, about one race versus another race, about the, how the whites have stole Indian lands, how the whites have uh, denied Indians of their fishing rights, their land rights, and everything. This all is kind of. Uh, you know, is put into focus in this process uh, of uh, education of these Indian kids in this foster home and also at BYU. They're again exposed to these type of teachings. And then they make the decisions for themselves. 
you know. And so it's great, as far as I'm concerned, to, to have this outlook. And, and so therefore, because of this, and also because of the type of program BYU has, Indian kids are attracted to BYU. In other words, BYU doesn't go out and try to recruit Indian students. Indian kids want to come to BYU. And right now we have more applications than we can handle. And we cannot accept all Indian students. We can accept so much. This year we limited uh, the uh, enrollment to 500 Indian kids. And maybe two or three years from now we may again increase it so we can bring in a lot more. But right now we have uh, enough to handle. So, so these kids want to go there. But there's something good there. Not only the top faculty members are interested in Indian students, but there's a, a curriculum that they can handle that tells them who they are and what their purpose in life should be. So this, uh, the faculty, the philosophy of BYU, the church, all this combined is helping the, the Indian students uh, to achieve equal education, equal opportunities in every sense. So now that I've cleared that <laughs> a little bit about BYU. You're saying, uh, I'm just kind of questioning this. You're saying that they uh, decide, they help you decide what your identity is. This comes from the Book of Mormon. No, they didn't decide for me who I was. I decided for myself who I was. Well, if, if, if you are exposed to enough teaching, though, and you, know, you can almost sway anybody with enough rhetoric, Mm -hmm. and nice enough words for enough people. I would think that you can almost, you know, the Book of Mormon is going this far to help me decide what it is. Maybe they're just going a little bit too far in helping these people. No. I just, you know, no, well, well, maybe, maybe, I'm not saying that when we go into the foster home that, they, you know, they, there's times where they really preach to us and anything like that. It, when you go into that home, you're just like a member of the family. In other words, you play with your white brothers and sisters, you have toys if you're eight years of age. You know, you're one of the group. You know, you, you're, you're one of the children as far as they're concerned. And they help you, give you money to go to school on when you reach high school, you know, for books and stuff. And they buy you at Christmas time bikes and anything that you need. They treat you as one of their children. This is what I'm saying. And, and uh, what they have to teach their children, you know, applies to you also. They don't treat you, you're an Indian, you're going to have to be taught different, you know. They don't say that. You're just one of the boys, you're one of the group, family members. Does the Navajo religion conflict with the uh, Mormon religion? Well, uh, it does. Uh, I mean, I think all tribes say that they have their own tribal, you know, religion. Navajo religion has the same, has a similar, you know, philosophy that they, the tribe says we have our own way of life, which is true, you know. Just because I became a Mormon doesn't mean that I forgot my people, that I forgot my culture. I go back every summer when I was on this program. I went to the squad dances, I went to the ceremony with my family. I didn't disregard anything. But I, but I slowly began to realize that these, that, that, uh, I was poor, you know, as, as uh, more and more as I you know, was in school and this foster home and also uh, other similar experiences, uh, told me that uh, my people, my parents, my particular family and my people really do need help educationally and economically, you know. And uh, at the time when I was on a reservation, I didn't know I was poor because this is just a common way of life for me, you know. Uh, living off the land, eating jackrabbits and prairie dogs, and, and sometimes snakes and lizards. You know, this is this is my life. This is my upbringing. You know, and and on top of all that, my dad and my mom taught me. They they have their teachings. They they told me about uh, how they perceive the world, their philosophy of life, uh, respect for woman, respect for nature. You know. Uh, they taught me that uh, every animal, every bird, every insect, every, you know, nature, in other words, respect nature. He said, because God gave you life and he gave life to these creatures, whatever it may be, nature. So we live with nature. We appreciated nature, you know. 
And, and so this was my teaching from my parents. I respect it and I still have it. And, and so when I became a Mormon, it doesn't mean I disregarded everything I was, you know, as far as a Navajo goes. I still am a Navajo, a Mormon Navajo, I might say. But I can be a Navajo anywhere I go. I can be a Navajo in New York or L.A. I, w I don't have any hangouts, you know. I know who I am. And I know what my responsibilities are to help Indian people, to help people in general. And I, I, I can be just as comfortable living here in L.A. as all, on a reservation, or in New York or Chicago or any city, urban area. And I wouldn't have these hangouts that uh, unfortunately a lot of our Indian people have because they have not you know, uh, stabilized themselves to the point where they can live in a city as well as on a reservation. So this is what it ha is doing for the Indian kids. It's making them stronger. Isn't it a terrible culture shock for a child to be transferred, you know, from the reservation to into a white family? It must be. It is. Very My foster parents, parents told me the first two or three months I was in their home, I didn't say a word, not even a hello or hi, you know, because like this the very point you mentioned. Because it was so new, you know, it was a complete change from a reservation, a different way of life, into a dominant uh, American way of life, you know. And I had to make some adjustments, which I did, you know. I had to uh, get used to eating a uh, lot of different foods. The first time I ate shrimp, you know, I had hives all over my body. And, you know, and, and other foods I ate, which kind of caused some kind of, a, you know, <laughs> either illness or a sickness to come up on me, but I got used to it. On a reservation, all I was used to was jackrabbits and prairie dogs and sheep, mutton, you know. And then to come over here to a new home with a new culture and to appreciate candy, ice cream, you know, and cake, dessert, you know, and, and vegetables and, and different kinds of meat. That's a new thing. So it had effect on my physical being. But uh, enough of that. <laughs> Uh, I just wanted to mention that, you know, just to kind of, uh, uh, if you had any questions on it, just to kind of clear it up. Uh, here is some pamphlets that you might want to, wish to pick up. It explains in detail our Indian program at BYU. Why we have reduced 60% dropout rates of Indian students going to college to a 13 down to 10% dropout rate. And that's a phenomenal. And uh, that's what's happening at BYU. A lot of institutions, Indian kids go there and then before the end of the year they drop out. They go back to the reservation and just simply drop out. Here at BYU, they stay until they graduate, until they have their degrees. And you can see why uh, uh, a little bit when you read these uh, pamphlets on our education program. But uh, I just want to cover, uh, if you're interested, this certain bill that's now pending before Congress, which is called the uh, Indian Comprehensive Education Bill. Uh, I don't know if you read about it or if you're acquainted with it. As you know, in 1970, uh, President Nixon, uh, his message to Congress on Indian education and Indian affairs in general, I don't know if you read uh, his message or his speech on uh, Indian affairs. In there, he came up with seven proposals, seven programs to help Indian people. And one of those programs is, uh, uh, I'll just briefly mention what he's trying to do. He said that uh, the bill uh, under Eisenhower administration, House Resolution 108, which has to do with termination should be repealed. In other words, under Eisenhower, there's a lot of Indian tribes that have been terminated. Like the uh, in Wisconsin, there's a particular tribe terminated. In, in Oregon, Klamath, Oregon, uh, another tribe terminated. And in uh, southern Utah, another tribe terminated under th this termination policy. Now, Nixon's policy was to repeal termination and replace it with Indian self-determination. That was his message. When he discussed Indian self-determination, he said all programs, even schools, now being run by non-Indians, 
should be placed in the hands of Indian people. There's a lot of federal programs now in existence run by non-Indians for Indians. He said this should be run by Indians. And right now he said that uh, schools, public schools, where there's a lot of Indian kids involved, that school should contract with Indian people and that school should be run by Indian people. And right now in BIA, there's a lot of schools now, these federal boarding schools, that have all Indian school boards. And these school boards are now contracting with the school, and the whole school is transferred into Indian hands. And for the first time, Indian people are now making decisions regarding the education of their parents or their children. Rough Rock, for one, is one of those schools. At Rough Rock, there's all Indian school board. And these school board members are traditional Navajos. They don't speak an ounce of English, but yet they're on the school board. But yet they fire and hire teachers. But yet they have something to say about curriculum, what should be taught at school. And they're doing a tremendous job of running that school. What about the, the teachers are the Indians too? Is that Over close to 90% of teachers are Indians. Now when I say Indians, I mean these are certified Indian teachers, full-blooded Navajos. Which universities? Some Indian, some Eastern universities or some older? Rough, what do you mean, what university? Are they from your university? No, Rough Rock is not in any way affiliated with BYU. I'm just saying that B Rough Rock is one of the schools that uh, is now gone to the hands of Indian people themselves. It's being run by Indians. And uh, they're being supported by BIA foundations and various agencies, you know. And uh, this is one school that BIA has contracted with the local community. And the local community is running this school, as it should be. You know, if you know anything about Indian education, uh, BIA philosophy, you know, philosophy in education, has been one of uh, assimilation, trying to assimilate the Indians into white culture. Because of this philosophy, uh, they've taught that uh, Indian kids should be Americanized. In other words, Indian kids shouldn't learn anything about their language or anything about their history. Rough Rock broke that trend broke that tradition. Uh, one of the schools, there's other schools, you know, that did, did, did the same thing. And Rough Rock began to teach Indian kids their own language first before they learn English. And then they learn about their own history as well as American history. So it's a bicultural, bilingual program at Rough Rock. And then uh, they initiated other programs, crafts programs. Indian people come to that school, they make saddles, they make blankets, they make jewelry, and then in turn they what they make, they can sell to tourists and other people that are interested. They make money off these, their crafts. And then uh, a parent can go into a classroom anytime he or she wants to see what their child is learning. If they don't like what they see in a the classroom, they can mention this to the teacher. See, they have a say-so in the classrooms, what's being taught. And also, uh, these uh, parents, uh, are being taught how to write their name, how to uh, count to ten, how to write numbers, anything all the way up to learning about science, the world outside, through a, a program called Adult Basic Education. So for the first time, Indian people are involved, really involved, not just token involvement. They're really involved. They're in it. And Rough Rock is just one of those schools. And this is what Nixon was talking about, President Nixon, that slowly these programs should be turned over to Indian people. And it's happening. Mm -hmm. I had an occasion to travel all over the country last year. And other places doing the same thing. Uh, back in Rocky Boy, Montana, the whole school district is run by Indians. Can you imagine that? This was unheard of before. But there, the whole school district the superintendent is an Indian. The whole school district is run by an Indian person. And they're getting their funds from the states and federal government. 
So this, this thing is catching hold right now. And Indian people are coming up. They're better educated, more Indian kids in college now. They, they demand education. My mom, when I was in college, asked me one day, you know, son, what in the world are you doing in school so long? Because the school to her was going to school 1 through 12, you know, that was all. And she thought I was supposed to be through at 12th grade. This was when I was in college. She said, look at your brother. He has a nice car, he has kids, he has a home, has a job. Look at you. What do you have to say for yourself? You know, you, you've got nothing. You're not married, you don't have a car, you don't have a job. You're in school. Why go to school if, you, if it's not going to bring you uh, a family or a, a job, food on the table, you know? She was confused. And this is, in essence, the way Indian people are now. Some of them still are in this situation. They don't know anything about education. They don't know what it means to be educated. They don't know what it means to have a degree, you know. So gradually this is being erased because of this uh, new policy, federal policy, Indian self-determination. And it is a good policy. And. Uh, I think the termination policy has or will be repealed. So, as I travel, I, I can sense, you know, an uprising. But this is a, a different kind of uprising of Indian people. Not an uprising to, you know, with spears and guns and bows and arrows and, you know, to, to kill or to steal or anything like this, but a different kind of uprising. A, a new self-determination that I sense in Indian people. They are speaking up, the young kids especially. As I travel at these various conferences, you know, Indian kids question me. They say, sometimes some of them say to me, you're an apple, you know, you're red outside and you're white inside. They really, they're challenging me, you know, and this is good, I like challenge, I like pressure. And for the first time, they're really thinking of who they are. They're trying to find and search of who they are, what they can do, how they can get involved. They question everything. This is good. They question federal officials. And I was in Washington, D.C. Indian groups come every day to Washington, D.C. and question Senator Kennedy and other senators. They question Commissioner of Education, Sidney P. Marlin. Said, you're a big fed here. What are you doing for the Indians? And these big shots in the government are cornered sometimes. They don't know what to say. Another group came in that said, Commissioner Marlin, what is, do you have any policy, any OE policy that will help Indian in their education? And sad to say, Commissioner Marlin can't say anything but say no, because there is no OE policy right now that will kind of uh, give financial uh, aid to any Indian tribes directly without going through the states. And so they're questioning everything, which is good. They're questioning their rights and their opportunities, their land rights, their fishing rights, their education rights. This ordinary human rights that they're concerned about. And they're not just out to destroy or to demonstrate schools, bomb buildings, or to destroy a campus, or in any destructive means. They try to avoid this, as I see it. But they just want an even chance, like any citizen of the United States, an equal education, e equal employment. This is all they want. But for a person that uh, a lot of people, white people and Indian people, when the Indian students or Indian people are in this way, in this uh, uh, really speaking out for their rights, they question that. They, they think that uh, they're, they're militants. You know, they, they use militants and, and red power, and, and they don't really understand this movement. But to me, it's a movement that's uh, legitimate. It really is. This red power is not, something, is not something destructive. Red power is just a movement where Indian people are, for the first time, are speaking out and saying, we want an equal chance. We want a, a, a fair shake. And they're right. They've been denied all these things. Too many places in this country right now, as I found out last year, 
Indians are still being discriminated against, you know. For instance, I talked to a high school principal where there's a lot of Indian students, and he personally directly said to me, these Indian kids, they're no good, they're stupid, they can't make it in high school. And all this time he's been, been getting all this money from the government to try to help these Indian kids. And instead of using it for the Indian kids, he bought new school buses, new football equipment for the team, carpet the whole school. Now that's a misuse of federal funds. This is what we found out. We had an investigation. This JOM money you, you speak of, Johnson O'Malley, we investigated that also. Even though these school districts receive a lot of money from JOM through the states, it's being misused. It's being abused, literally. It's not doing good that it was intended to do. Because principals, these non-Indians are in, in a, a power structure. They have a decision to spend the money any way they want because they know that nobody's going to check on them. So they, so they spend it on new school equipment or to build a new school or to uh, buy a band instrument, things like this. But this is changing right now in this day and age. If an Indian student or any Indian leader sees that, immediately he, he does something about it. He complains, a legitimate complaint. And this is red power. An Indian speaking out for his own rights. And he sees these situations, a misuse of funds. That's just a, a one illustration. He can go into land rights and fishing rights with similar illustrations. Uh, this is an education. And as I went around the country, whenever a situation like this arises, an Indian parent that doesn't speak English, she or he gets into the act also. They speak out. They tell the principal, look, you're, 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 what you're doing here is wrong. And immediately, you know, the, the non-Indian teachers and principals say, hey, we have a militant Indian here, you know. They label them again. And this is red power, this militant movement. is uh, Sometimes it gets out of hand, you know. Sometimes there's a little destruction. But it's a legitimate movement. And the Indian people for the first time are crying out. They're being involved. They said, we want to get involved in school, in politics, in power structure, in a decision making. We want to be principals. We want to get on the school board. We want to be teachers. We want to make decisions. And this is what they're saying. And I'm proud to say that all over the country this is happening. In Maine, I was there. They have what they call a pro and tribe. It stands for something, but it's a tremendous program. The whole elementary, I think two or three elementary schools run by Indians, and school districts run by Indians. The movement is on the way, and there's a lot of senators, sympathetic senators, who know that these Indian people have legitimate complaints and they're helping them, like Senator Kennedy. He introduced this bill that will help Indian people if it passes. When I was there, three other senators introduced similar bills to help Indian people. So the interest and concern is there. And the Indian people have made a breakthrough. For the first time, the Indian people are being listened to. Senators are now perking up. They're stopping to listen to these Indian people that come to Washington, D.C. When I was there, I had a lot of Indian people come to my office. They challenge me. They, they, they say I'm an apple, but I'm not. After explaining what I was trying to do, then their questions are answered. They no longer label me as an apple, but one of the, you know, a leader that's trying to do something for the Indian people. But I don't question their questioning, you know, their complaints. It's right. It's legitimate. It's, a, it's due. Too long. We have just set back and been passive. We let everything, every people, any organization, agency, they did everything for us. Kind of kicked us back. But now the movement is here. And it's about time. So this movement is on. And in the years to come, 
it's going to make a lot of breakthroughs. And Indian people will have an effect in our nation. Because in our church, in the Book of Mormon, again, I don't want to be too religious, but we have a lot of promises. We have a lot of prophecies pertaining to Indian people. And one scripture in there, it says that someday the Indian people will become like a lion among sheep. The white people will be the sheep and the Indian people will be the lion. That's what it says. I don't know the, the literal interpretation of the scripture, but all through the Book of Mormon it says this, that the Indian people will become <coughs> a great people. They will blossom as a rose. And this is happening. And in there also it says the Gentile nation, which is the white people, people not of Israel. If they will not shape up, they're going to lose. They're going to be destroyed. Just like in the Book of Mormon, we have these two groups of people, the Nephites and the Lamanites. The Nephites are the white people. They, they lived here long before Columbus, long before anybody was here. They had great civilization. And anthropologists are now beginning to dig up that civilization that was here through South America and through this country. Anyway, the Nephites were completely wiped out by the Lamanites, which is the Indian people, the forefathers of the Indian people, because the Nephites were so unrighteous and so wicked they were just destroyed by the hand of God. And this nation is a promised land. And one day, if this nation doesn't shape up, it's going to be destroyed the same way. Maybe not by Indian people, but some kind of destruction. And you can see right now that the nation is heading in that direction because of the corruption and wickedness, immorality in the cities, on campuses, everywhere. And this prophecy is literally being fulfilled. And in the people are coming up. But in the book it says they will not become great if they don't become a righteous people. And you don't become righteous if you hate a white man or if you hate a person or trying to cause contention and hate among people. And that is our philosophy at Brigham Young University. Make any people a great people. And this is happening right now all over the country. I thank you for this presentation and I hope that I may have said something that might have been beneficial to you. I will end it there. In closing, I want you to know that I, as an Indian person, my destiny, my goal, again, let me say, will be with Indian people, but not, you know, not all Indian people, but I can help any person that needs help. And I'm very concerned about this, uh, the problem that we have in Indian education. Too many reports say we have 60% dropout rate among Indian students. I've run into a lot of research that says Indian kids don't have love and affection at home, which is so untrue. Some dumb anthropologist or researcher comes to the reservation that he does research. He goes back to the university and says Indian kids are unhappy. Indian kids are this way. They don't know beans about Indian people. I as an Indian know, and I just have to chuckle when I read a research or study that says Indian people are this way, Indian kids are this way. But that is not true, that is not so. Indian people are great people in their own right. In my culture, in my tribe right now, we have many PhDs. I speak my own language. But when I go to my reservation, I can't begin to compete or speak with my PhD elders. In other words, I speak Navajo on an elementary level. And I know a little bit compared to the wisdom and knowledge and intelligence of these so-called illiterate, uneducated Navajos. Because these Navajos can cure cancer, these medicine men. When I say medicine man, this doesn't mean it's some kind of a stupid witch doctor that has horns on his head. That's not it. 
a medicine man to a tribe, like in my tribe, he's a psychologist, a psychiatrist, a counselor, name it, he's it. He's very respected. He means something to the people, like in my tribe, he is. He's something special. He's all these things that I mentioned. He knows about plants. He knows what plants can cure cancer. He knows what plants can cure certain disease. I had my father check into a hospital last year. And he had an operation. And the doctor said he had cancer less than two years to live. Today he is alive because he returned to the resident. He went and sought a medicine man. And this particular medicine man told him what plants to use to help him out. And he went to the mountain and got this certain plant. And it cured the cancer that's supposed to be in his body. See, this is the kind of stuff that these Indian people know that the white doctors or Indian doctors don't even know about. And they don't even care to listen to an Indian medicine man. Because he's already stereotyped. He's already labeled as somebody stupid, illiterate, Indian. Which he is not. They know so much, but they can't write to put it on paper. All they can do is pass it on verbally, generation to generation. Right now, this knowledge, this wisdom possessed by the medicine man is being wiped out by the influence of the dominant culture, dominant society. It's getting to the point where all this knowledge, all this wisdom is dying out. And that's why Rough Rock has instituted a program where the Indian young people, students, will be taught to become medicine men. That's just like being taught to become an MD to preserve this knowledge, to preserve this wisdom. Not only about plants, about life, about animals, but the universe, the purpose in life. These things Indian people possess. And that's why you might say they're very, very spiritually rooted. This is the, the stuff that has kept them together through all...